so in this lecture we are going to discuss on the foundation so these are the topics that we are going to discuss what is foundry then we'll see the pattern pattern materials and the types of pattern the pattern allowances sand molding and types of sand code and code print mold materials and its desirable properties and in the next lecture uh, we are going to learn foundry tools the different types of furnaces and casting defects so let us start with the definition of foundry so foundry is a place that produces metal casting okay so you just try to remember these points like the metals are cast into shapes by melting them into a liquid pouring the metal into a mold and removing the mold material after the metal has been solidified as it cools and in this process parts of desired shapes and sizes can be formed so this is what is casting uh, in short which is basically done in the place called foundry the most common metals are processed are aluminum and cast iron definitely there are other metals uh, those also can be cast like steel zinc and other different kinds of alloys uh, but most commonly cast iron and the aluminum now let us start with the definition of pattern in the carpentry shop already you have made a pattern so the pattern are basically the model for the object to be cast okay so a pattern makes an impression on the mold and the liquid metal is poured into the mold and the metal solidifies its shape of the uh, original pattern and finally that particular cast product is produced so pattern is basically uh, this thing which is the model of the actual final product after solidification which is called the cast product that we want to make of the similar shape and size okay so this part is what is the pattern let us first see that what are the different kinds of casting uh, can be done uh, definitely all these kind of castings we are not going to carry out in our lab in our foundry shop we are only going to uh, practice the sand casting process okay but other than sand casting there are other kinds of castings like shell mold casting investment casting die casting centrifugal casting continuous casting okay so these are also there now before going to that uh, let me tell you one thing regarding the uh, pattern which is used for the uh, sand casting already you have seen that we made one pattern uh, in our carpentry shop which is made of wood right uh, and you have also seen that pattern uh, generally made of very soft materials wood plastic like that but it is also possible to make the pattern of metals the metal patterns are also common in industry the why because you can understand if we use the wooden pattern or the soft pattern several times in the molding shop to create the mold then uh, it is possible that uh, those pattern will damage because they are made of soft material wood can absorb moisture okay their corners will damage so dimensional accuracy accuracy uh, will be uh, not very high if you use several times this kind of patterns maybe for small number of times you can use the wooden patterns but if you have to use the same pattern again and again for uh, maybe uh, many times in that case it is better to use a metal pattern okay so again that metal pattern is made with the help of some uh, wooden pattern definitely right and we can use that metal pattern several times after it is uh, created so that metal pattern itself is first casted with the help of some uh, wooden pattern and that wooden pattern which is used to cast that the metal pattern uh, that is called the uh, master pattern 
so master pattern is made of wood basically or any soft material and that is uh, required to produce a metal pattern and that metal pattern is used to uh, produce the molds for the uh, for the production uh, thing okay so in that way you just try to remember this thing regarding the pattern material so it is not that all the time it is the wood or the soft material used rather many times it is the metal pattern which helpful okay now sand casting we are going to do in our lab and here you can see there are different types of other kinds of castings so one by one we are going to see their processes and try to visualize so that you can remember the method okay so first of all we'll see the uh, typical sand casting process different flask used one is at the bottom another one is at the top okay so the bottom flask uh, which is called the drag and the top flask which is called the coke okay and in the coke part which is at the top you observe along with that piece of pattern uh, there are two different pins are inserted okay so this one is called the sprue pin okay through which actually metal is poured so because this pin is going to create a cavity so that you can pour the metal into the mold and this is what is called the riser pin and through that excess metal the excess liquid metal will come up and we will be able to understand that uh, the complete metal gone into that cavity or maybe because of the shrinkage some of the liquid will be supplied from the excess that is there within the riser okay so we'll see all these things later on but right now we just observe how uh, the mold cavity is created in sand mold casting <laughs> These are the venting wax, and these venting wax are actually used to create the pores within the or the holes within the, um, the sand, so that the uh, moisture, uh, because of heat, may come out uh, from the mold, uh, or the gas entrapped gas may come out from the mold. 
okay otherwise some kinds of uh, rusting defects will come so we'll see that uh, what kind of rusting defects may come because of that but it is very important to create some uh, passages so that the moisture of the gases can come out okay so that is why this kind of venting is done that has been created so that uh, gradually the molten metal that is poured into the uh, uh, into the pin will not come directly into the pin initially that will come here in the pouring basin and then gradually uh, it will go into the mold cavity okay again it is not a straight pin if you observe carefully it is a tapered pin so that it will come gradually and after that uh, you find that uh, there is a cut that is made so that from that pin location it will go to the uh, mold cavity. So the molten metal, so that molten metal can go through this path into the mold cavity. Okay. So this is a kind of a gate that is created. Okay. Uh, from uh, so that the molten metal can go into the mold cavity. So this is uh, about the gating system. How the uh, molten metal pass from the pouring basin, then through the uh, uh, runner, and then finally through the gate to the mold cavity. <laughs> that how with the help of pattern with the help of two molding flask cope and drag we can create the uh, cavity and here if you observe carefully we have divided the pattern into two parts because of its shape uh, then separately two molding flasks are used to create the mold and finally uh, we join this thing in this way and then after pouring finally we move, uh, when the liquid metal will solidify and after that this uh, mold material that means this sand mold uh, is a break and the first product is taken out okay so this is what about the sand casting now see another kind of expandable mold casting which is the shell mold casting okay the mold is thin shell made up of sand and which is held together by thermosetting resin binder here the process consists of following steps the first step is to create pattern and here pattern is a composed of two pieces which are created in shape of desired part. The next step is to create mold. During creating the mold, each pattern half is heated to 175 to 370 degrees Celsius and coated with lubricant to facilitate removal. Heated pattern is clamped to dumb box which contain mixture of sand and resin blender. The dumb box is inverted allowing the sand resin mixture to coat the pattern. The heated pattern partially cures the mixture which now forms a shell around the pattern. Each pattern half and surrounding shell is cured to completion in oven and then shell is ejected from the pattern. The next step is to assemble the shell mold. Here two shell are joined together and securely camped to form the complete shell mold. The shell mold is then placed in flask and supported by baking material. The next step is to pour the molten metal. During this step, the mold is securely clamped together and molten metal fills the mold cavity. After mold has been filled, the molten metal is allowed to cool and solidify into the shape of final casting. After molten metal has cooled, the mold can be broken and casting removed. Here trimming and cleaning processes are required to remove any excess material. So you have seen the shell molding process where the molding material that is used is basically uh, the sand and resin, sand and resin, which is used as the material. And uh, when it is come in contact with the hot uh, pattern, then it basically attach with the pattern with the thickness. 
and that particular shell mold is finally formed with the shape of the pattern around it. Okay, so this is how the shell molding is done for the investment customer. Okay. see basically the wax is injected into a die casting machine where uh, it is basically cast according to the shape of the die and initially a wax pattern is created in this way okay so the green one is the wax pattern then it is attached with a common wax runner as you can see and other similar patterns are created so multiple patterns are attached in the common runner then as you can see the whole uh, pattern set is dipped into ceramic slurry and it is not that a single time it is dipped it is dipped several times to attain a particular thickness of the ceramic slurry around the wax. Now you can see that is placed inside an oven uh, where it is heated and if you heat it, it is clear that the wax will melt and it will come out. But it is made of uh, outside uh, thin layer which is made of the ceramic uh, material that will be there that is not going to melt or any way damage only the uh, wax will melt and that will come out and in this way finally you get this kind of a hollow structure and it is basically the mold and which is made of the ceramic material is given so that they can break and the mold is basically uh, getting out and finally you will get the cast uh, product and definitely you can see that your pattern is basically the single unit uh, this is basically your pattern so what you have to do you have to cut each and everything this common runner these individual gates everything you have to cut and finally you have to finish it uh, so you can see in this particular picture total eight pattern will be cast in a single go. So I hope you have understood that what is the uh, process of investment casting. Uh, the name investment came from the fact that it is dipped into or invested into the ceramic slurry to create that mold. Now after these three kinds of expandable mold uh, techniques that you have observed, expandable mold means that Finally, to get out the cast product, you have to collapse the uh, mold material, the whole mold that you have to break to get out the uh, cast product. Now, there are some permanent uh, uh, mold method, permanent mold casting. So, these are like die casting or centrifugal casting. These are permanent mold casting. So, let us see what is the die casting. So, die casting again can be a hot chamber or it can be a cold chamber. So hot chamber and cold chamber, actually the name is there, whether furnace is an integrated part of the whole uh, process or not. If the furnace is a part of the whole uh, process, then it is a hot chamber. And if uh, liquid metal is poured into that particular thing, a furnace is not integrated part and it is a cold chamber. Okay, so cold chamber uh, die casting process, let us see that. So here you can see that with the help of a ladle, 
a liquid vapor is poured into this chamber and then this ram moved and that is giving the pressure and here you can see this yellow colored part that means uh, here you see this part this is basically the cavity this is basically the cavity created by this uh, dye okay one is this one is the fixed dye as you can see and this uh, one is the movable dye that can be moved okay so what will happen now the liquid metal will be forced into this cavity and observe the process how finally So this is a permanent mold. Here you can see that the mold is permanent, which is in the form of this die. Okay, and because when these two die come close, then you see that the mold cavity is created. So it's a permanent die. So when uh, you are taking out the cast product after solidification, this particular mold you need not to break. So this is a permanent kind of a permanent mold casting process. Now coming to see the hot chamber. Observe here. Uh, here you can see this is what is the mold cavity. This is basically the mold cavity. You want this kind of a shape uh, in the casting, and you can see that the furnace is integrated part of the system. So what is happening? Uh, this particular flanger or this particular ram, when it is going to move in this direction, it will give pressure to this liquid like aluminium, zinc. These are generally used in this case. And that is going to force or inject it into this particular dye, uh, and then uh, the process is exactly similar to what we have seen earlier. It is allowed to solidify and it is taken out. Okay, so let us see it once again. Hopefully, you have understood that how uh, the dye casting process operates. Now, you see another kind of permanent uh, mold uh, casting process, which is centrifugal casting. Let us see first this.
process is going on initially the liquid metal is fed into the center of this uh, rotating uh, mold and this is a permanent mold as you can see and this is rotating at a very high speed so what happens when the liquid metal is fed through the center then it will gradually goes uh, around the circumference because of the centrifugal action and definitely uh, as you increase the amount of molten metal its thickness from the circumference will gradually increase so some kind of a hollow structure will be a hollow a symmetric structure will be created uh, through this method okay so this is what is the centrifugal casting now finally we will see another kinds of casting which is called the continuous casting continuous casting means uh, it is a single pathway where one end liquid metal is poured and the other end when it is coming out it is the uh, final cast product which is coming out so let us see the process of the continuous casting Continuous casting is the process used to solidify the molten steel ready for shaping into a huge range of final products. A ladle of steel is teamed or poured through a gas tight refractory tube into a tun dish. The tun dish is a reservoir that allows the steel to flow at a controlled rate through further gas tight refractory tubes and into a series of water cooled copper molds. With only the outer shell solidified, the steel is drawn from the bottom of the mould through a curved arrangement of support rolls and water sprays. It so here you try to understand that the liquid metal is coming from the ladle first, from ladle to it comes to the uh, tan dish, which is a common reservoir, which is distributing into uh, separate copper moulds. Here you can see these are basically the permanent copper moulds and through which it is taking the shape of this mold. And during the process, what is happening? Uh, it is cooled down with the help of water jets. As you can see that water jet is continuously spraying uh, so that it can cool down, okay? Drawn from the bottom of the mold through a curved arrangement of support rolls and water sprays. It emerges horizontally in the form of a solid steel strand. At this point, it is cut to length using automatic gas burners. Depending on their size, these solid shapes are called billets, blooms or slabs and are now ready for shaping into finished products. So this is what is the continuous casting process as you have seen that one end it is the liquid metal that is uh, poured and finally when it is coming out as a form of a billet or a bloom uh, depending upon the shape. Okay, so these are the different kinds of casting processes uh, which are uh, found in industry. So in this particular uh, course, uh, we'll see mainly the different aspects of the sand casting. Uh, in case of a sand casting process, what are the different kinds of pattern that is produced? And it is very important to visualize all these kinds of pattern. Okay, so you first see the different kinds of pattern like single piece pattern or a two piece pattern, multi piece pattern, loose piece pattern, cope and drag pattern, sweep pattern, shell pattern, skeleton pattern, okay, segmental, follow board, match plate, gated pattern. So let us see through this video, animated video, so that you can visualize these different kinds of patterns, how they are creating the mold. Solid pattern. Now, we are going to see about solid pattern. The solid pattern is the simplest type of pattern exactly like the desired casting. For making a mold, the pattern is accommodated either in cope or drag. The molding process is quite inconvenient and time consuming. So, such patterns are used for producing a few large castings. Split pattern. Let us see an example for split pattern. A split pattern is a solid pattern which is split into two halves. This split patterns has dowel holes and dowel pin for joining both halves. These split patterns are used for casting large products. Match plate pattern. Let us see an example for match plate pattern. Match plate patterns 
are widely used for casting products more than one in a single molding box. Cope side pattern, drag side pattern, match plate. In this, the split pattern with runner and gate system are mounted on a wooden or a metal board called match plate. Drag. Then this match plated is assembled with the cope and drag box. This match plate with split pattern can be withdrawn from the mold easily. Cope and drag pattern. Let us see an example for cope and drag pattern. It consists of cope pattern, drag pattern, match plane. The pattern made up of two halves are mounted on individual match plates. Flask are placed individually on each side of the pattern. In this, the cope and drag part of the mold are prepared separately and assembled for casting. Cope and drag are removed. These patterns are used for casting heavy products. Gated pattern. Let us see an example for gated pattern. Runner, pattern, gate, spur. It is basically the sprue, okay? The sprue pin, which is actually connected. Here you can see this is the common runner, okay? And uh, these are basically the individual patterns. So you can see that the many patterns can be uh, casted in a single go in a single uh, flask and the important thing that you observe the whole getting system like runner the individual gates to the pattern is already there within this pattern okay so this is called the gated pattern the whole getting system as well as the pattern is actually created uh, maybe made of wood okay and then uh, it is basically the mold is created in the mass production of castings, more mold cavities are formed in single mold. Such molds are formed by joining a number of mold cavities by using common gate and razor system. Hence, this type of patterns are called as gated pattern. Skeleton pattern. Let us see an example for skeleton pattern. In small number of large casting, it is not economical to use solid pattern. In such cases, skeleton pattern are preferred. Skeleton pattern is a ribbed construction of wood, which forms an outline of the pattern. This wooden frame is filled with loam sand and ramp. Trickle board. The surplus sand is removed by strickle board. For round shape, the pattern is made in two halves and joined with glue or by means of screws. Loam sand. Sweep pattern. Let us see an example for sweep pattern. 
sweep pattern are used for forming large symmetrical mold by revolving a sweep attached to a spindle spindle sweep cavity segmental pattern let us see an example for simple segmental pattern segment of casting pivot pin after ramming one section the segmental pattern goes to the next section This process is repeated until the entire mold is completed. Mold cavity. Shell pattern. Let us see an example for shell pattern. Pop up pattern. drag half pattern shell patterns are used for casting hollow products outer shape of the pattern is used for making the mold shape of the pattern is used for making the core loose piece pattern in this video we are going to see about loose piece pattern loose piece pattern consists of pattern and drag Now the pattern is removed from the drag. So you have seen the different types of pattern and how they are actually uh, working. That means how they are creating the mold. Okay. So these are the different kinds of pattern. Now next we are going to see okay, let me see. code and code prints. Okay. Uh, in the last uh, video, you have observed that in case of a shell pattern, uh, something called core was mentioned. Actually, core is something which is used to create some hollow casting product. Okay. Suppose we want to create this uh, particular casting, which is basically hollow, like uh, you can see that final uh, mold cavity, if you observe here, it is basically this one. I'm showing in blue that this is what is the, this is what is the thing that you want to make. Okay. So you can understand this is what is the material and this is basically the hollow part. So this is the final product that I want to make. Okay. I have just drawn the sectional view, but basically you can understand uh, this is basically uh, this kind of a construction. Okay. This kind of a construction. This kind of a hollow thing. Okay. So suppose we want to make this kind of a thing and for that the kind of pattern that we are going to make you observe what we have done uh, this particular section you see carefully uh, i'm showing it uh, 
see this part where is this part in the mold uh, where is this part in the pattern so see that this part in the pattern is this part so we can easily identify okay then where is this part of the this is this part okay then what we have to do we have to make this hole if we create this kind of a cavity then it will become a solid thing na? but we have to make this hollow structure at the center you have to make a hole so at the center you have to make a hole so for that what we have done you see that we have created some extra part outside this part observe this part and this part that we have made in the pattern now if we make this part and we create cavity with the help of this pattern in this mold then what will be the what will be the mold cavity i'm showing the mold cavity in green observe the mold cavity with this pattern the whole pattern will create a mold cavity like this so this will be the complete mold cavity if we use this pattern to create a mold cavity okay so this will be the mold cavity but if you just pour the molten metal into it then what will happen it will become a complete solid thing our main objective at the hollow central will not be created so what we have done we have created we have created a separate material which is made of again a coarse sand which is basically called core so core is made of uh, coarse sand uh, we'll see that what is coarse sand and uh, this is basically uh, having very high compressive strength and okay so this coarse sand we have created of exactly the similar length as this part and we put that particular thing into this cavity but you see that what is the use of these extra two things because if we create in the pattern these two things then that will create some impression so that you can place this core into the cavity so that they can get balance or they will get support in that region because of this pattern this ends are going to give some impression so that you can keep that particular core into uh, here and here it will get supported and you can place the core here okay so these extra two things made in the pattern is called core print why core print are there so that they can create an impression so that core can sit in the mold Okay, because these are the places where this sand is placed. This whole core sand is placed within the mold. Okay, so core print actually creates an impression where core can sit. Okay, so you have understood now what is core. Core is used so that when you pour the molten metal, when you pour the molten metal into this cavity, then what will happen within that core? no metal will come only metal will come around this uh, core okay around this core it will come so that is why this part will become hollow finally when you uh, break the whole mold you can take out the core uh, this part will become hollow and you will get this hollow structure okay so i hope you understood that what is the meaning of core core is used to create the hollow structure and the core prints are there in the pattern to create that impression in the mold so that the core can sit in the mold okay now you see uh, the different kinds of pattern allowances okay so when we are given some th something that means uh, suppose we have to uh, create a particular shape maybe uh, like this we have to make a shape like this and this should be made of say cast iron this should be made of cast iron and all the dimensions are given so we have to cast so 
uh, we know the material cast iron and all the dimensions are given and this machine part is very important we have to uh, cast this thing so the st first step you know that we have to make a pattern of the similar shape may be made of some soft material or whatever so the question is when you will prepare the pattern will the pattern which is made of wood will be exactly the same shape of the and size of this or not suppose this length is say uh, 5 cm now the pattern that you are going to make suppose uh, the pattern that you want to make is this one for that will this dimension be exactly 5 or it will be different from that so here the question of allowances coming into picture so initially if the dimensions of the pattern how this is going to change when the casting will be completed okay so that all these allowances all the errors that might come uh, because of the whole process of casting that you have to take care of initially when you are uh, creating that pattern okay so what are those things so we have to consider the shrinkage allowance or the contraction allowance what do you mean by this shrinkage allowance see you are pouring the liquid metal into the cavity right so the liquid metal its temperature of the liquid metal will gradually decrease so when the temperature will decrease definitely it will contract then what happens from liquid it will convert it into solid so when the liquid will be converted into solid definitely its volume will change okay most of the cases the volume decreases but in some of the cases volume increases okay so depending upon the material you have to consider what kind of solidification uh, is uh, what kind of material you are taking and the final stage of the shrinkage of the contraction is the solid when it has been converted into solid at the melting point then gradually it will come to the room temperature okay so the cooling process of that particular solid okay so during that process definitely the shrinkage will take place okay now you see that in the first two stages of the shrinkage like when uh, liquid will uh, temperature will decrease and the phase change is taking place okay during these two processes uh, ev even if there is shrinkage or expansion whatever that may be that is compensated by the riser you know that there uh, we have given a provision uh, of the riser so that riser what happens that excess material go up into the and stored into the riser so whenever there will be a requirement of further uh, liquid the, from the riser the liquid again come back to the mold cavity and fulfill those requirement like generally in case of a liquid contraction and the solidification these two shrinkages will be compensated by the riser but after it has been completely solidified and only its temperature is decreasing that time the shrinkage that is taking place will not be possible to compensate by the riser because in the riser the, it is in the liquid form so it cannot compensate that so that shrinkage definitely will take place in the material so that because of the shrinkage you can understand that initially what kind of allowances you have to give you have to make the pattern larger in dimension so that even after shrinkage is taking place it will it can maintain its dimension Okay, so this is a positive allowance. The shrinkage allowance is a positive allowance. So the pattern should be uh, given a shrinkage allowance, some larger dimension you have to provide. Now coming to the draft or taper allowance. Draft allowance means uh, you know that the uh, it is required to uh, remove the pattern from the mold uh, uh, from the mold to create the cavity, right? Suppose here in this picture you observe this is the mold that has been shown and this is the pattern and if I want to remove the pattern suppose the pattern is like this within the mold suppose this is the mold and there is sand everywhere and if you want to take out the uh, pattern from the mold there is a chance that if it is the vertical then there is a chance that it will break the mold it will it may damage the mold right so uh, that is why to easier removal of the pattern from the mold what is done a very small angle is provided at the edge of the pattern so that the removal is easier 
okay so definitely you can understand in which direction this angle will be there so that gradually its uh, dimension will decrease in the downward direction or um, it will increase in the upward direction so that the removal will be easy okay so this is what is called the draft allowance okay so that uh, provision you have to give in the pattern so that the uh, mold will not damage again the machining allowances so this is again a positive allowance you can understand okay so finally uh, it is the uh, machining allowance what is the machining allowance now see that the cast product that you finally get you will find that its surface is very very rough okay the roughness is very uh, large roughness is there so finally uh, to uh, smooth it uh, or sometimes the uh, your dimensions might be required to change in by machining processes so that is why some machining processes is done after the casting is over okay so uh, that is why uh, some material removal is to be uh, done after the casting uh, will be done so that provision initially you have to give some extra cavity that means the extra dimensions you have to provide so that after machining uh, the final dimension should not be uh, should not below this uh, dimensions okay so this is again a positive uh, allowances that you have to give now coming to the distortion or the camber allowance distortion or camber allowance is like suppose you want to make this kind of a i section okay this kind of i section and uh, what happens actually you know very high temperature molten metal is uh, pouring into the mold cavity right so what happens because of high temperature the sand mold that also expand okay sand mold also may expand so uh, because of that what happens that that expansion uh, because of uh, temperature of the sand mold uh, is not uniform throughout okay depending upon the sections like if the section is very thin sections like u section v section this kind of i sections in that cases there is a chance that uh, because of non uniform thermal expansion of the sand mold the shape of of the final cast product you will find that that is distorted okay so what you will find that uh, if you just simply cool it if you make the pattern of this shape and finally, if the section is uh, this kind of I section, if you cool it, and you will find that this kind of distortion has been taken place. This will be your final cast product. Okay, so this is happening because uh, what I have told because of the uh, non-uniform thermal expansion that is taking place in the sand mold, because these are very thin sections. So, how to avoid this kind of uh, distortion? So, to avoid this kind of distortion, what happens? if we understand that okay the distortion is going to take place in that direction so initially in the pattern what we can do we can provide some camber okay so we can provide this kind of a pattern so that after distortion if over this pattern this kind of distortion takes place that means over this kind of a cavity if this kind of a distortion takes place then finally it is possible that it will become the final shape which exactly look like this eye section so the camber is actually given exactly the opposite kind of a distortion in the pattern okay so this is also called the camber allowances so that after distortion it will take the shape of the uh, original uh, requirement so this is what is the distortion of the camber allowance and finally is the shaking or the wrapping allowance shaking or wrapping allowance means again uh, if you want to take out the uh, pattern from the mold uh, it is not that directly you just uh, put the draw spike and you just pull it out from the mold. It's not so easy. So uh, it is uh, uh, required to shake the uh, pattern uh, so that the uh, closely attached uh, sand mold materials uh, that uh, that actually lose from the pattern surfaces because of some adhesion is already there within the material. So there is a chance that the mold materials will stick to the pattern surfaces so some amount of shaking is initially given okay initially some amount of shaking is given on the pattern and after that it is taken out so that uh, this is what is the process by which it is done and during that shaking process what happens during that shaking process the cavity itself 
becomes large okay the pattern is not large but because of the removal process because of the sh uh, shaking of the uh, uh, pattern to take it out from the mold uh, the cavity actually uh, gone up that increases okay so that allowances you have to give in the pattern so what kind of allowances it will be whether it will be positive or negative definitely it will be a negative allowance why it will be negative because uh, if you make the smaller size of pattern and then you give the shaking allowance the cavity is going to increase okay so it is a negative allowance that you have to give in the pattern okay so we have seen the different kinds of uh, pattern allowances and next we'll see the uh, types of molding sand what are the different kinds of molding sands uh, there remember uh, in the sand in general there are basically the silica sand and some binder and some additives these are the main things and the moisture these are the main things which are there now in green sand if you see what is green sand and green sand is green name from the fact that it contains moisture some amount of moisture is there that is why the name green okay so in green sand what are there it is basically containing the silica sand and uh, as a binder uh, clay is there okay as a binder clay is there and 18 to 30 percent clay is there and the moisture content is around 5 to 8 percent so this is what is the green sand content okay silica sand the clay and moisture acts as a binder as a whole and uh, it is used uh, for the uh, both ferrous and non-ferrous alloy casting okay so this is what is the green sand casting this green sand is used now coming to the dry sand so what is dry sand in the dry sand uh, as the name indicates that it is basically initially the mold is prepared with the help of a green sand okay so suppose you want to make a dry sand mold what is done initially the green sand mold is done okay so after making the green sand mold that whole mold cavity a whole mold cavity or the whole uh, molding flux is put under the oven to uh, bake it bake it means actually to heating up so that the moisture will come out from that okay so if the moisture come out and if you heat it uh, then what actually happens is that the strength of the mold uh, become um, become high okay so the, that is why the uh, this kind of thing or sometimes what happens with the help of uh, torches some flames uh, those molds are also heated to remove the moisture and those molds are also basically the dry sand molds and these are used for very large casting basically when the casting uh, load is such that the mold uh, strength should be very high so then this kind of uh, dry sand is used now coming to the loam sand you have if you remember that in case of a skeleton pattern uh, the loam sand term you have probably seen the loam sand is basically here the clay is around 50 percent around 50 percent clay whereas in case of a green sand you have observed is 20 to 30 percent but in clay is around 50 percent and the remaining is the silica sand and some amount of water is also there so it is like uh, more pl plasticity plasticity is much higher in case of a loam sand if you compare with respect to the green sand and it is used for very large casting uh, typically for the gray cast iron uh, casting large casting this kind of loam sand is used now a few uh, important terms like uh, parting sand okay the parting sand is pure silica sand okay completely pure silica sand nothing is there as you have observed probably in the different types of pattern initially some white kind of a powder is sprayed and after that the green sand is poured into the flux right so parting sand is basically uh, the uh, dry silica sand which is used uh, to separate uh, the uh, you can see that one molding flask is maybe the cope part the molding flask containing some uh, material and here in the drag part also that is containing some uh, green sand and if the parting sand is not there then what will happen uh, they can attach or stick to each other okay or the pattern may stick to the molding sand very uh, closely so that is why the parting sand is uh, used so that this uh, kind of attachment is not there and you can easily separate the two molding fluxes or you can separate uh, very easily uh, with the pattern 
okay now facing sand the facing sand uh, you see that it is the fresh silica sand and the clay which is used it is not the used sand you can use as a facing sand so sometimes what we happen what happened that the green sand uh, that is there we have used again we can use the same green sand maybe some kind of extra binder of the moisture we add to create the uh, kind of a system sand but in case of a facing sand you remember always you have to use the fresh silica sand and the clay and you have to create the facing sand so facing sand having very high refractoriness what is refractoriness refractoriness means the facing sand can sustain a very high temperature okay they can uh, sustain very high temperature see that uh, if you see that this is the pattern and if you see that this is the other part of the mold where these are the say uh, let me do it in a different color with the blue color i'm showing it to observe that here in the blue color i'm showing that this region which is the sand is in direct contact with the pattern or when you are removing the pattern after removing the pattern suppose you remove the pattern then what will happen after uh, removing the pattern after removing the pattern uh, you just make this region with the facing sand so facing sand is the sand and then you pouring the molten metal here in the cavity so facing sand is the sand which is in direct contact with the molten material that means the high temperature molten material is in direct contact with the facing sand and facing sand having very high refractoriness okay so that is why a uh, very uh, facing sand is there uh, just in contact with the uh, the sand which is in contact with the uh, molten metal the first contact with the molten metal will come with the facing sand okay so this region actually facing sand is placed and backing sand is actually uh, which is there just behind the uh, facing sand what happens actually uh, this is like uh, backing sand you can think in that way actually facing sand is costly backing sand is basically uh, very uh, not very costly it is very cheap so you can see that uh, the remaining part of this uh, that means this part may be the typical green sand i am showing by the green color this is the green sand and after that it is the backing sand which is just back of the uh, facing sand which is there to support the facing sand that's all but uh, at the front in contact with the molten metal it is the facing sand and backing sand is just back to the facing sand it is basically cheap suppose you want to make a three millimeter so in that case maybe one millimeter is facing sand and two millimeter may be the backing sand like that okay now finally the system sand system sand is basically uh, suitable for a particular application whatever requirement uh, accordingly uh, we use the sand we make the sand that means we can um, add some additives so that to enhance some of the properties of the molding material uh, we can add some more binders uh, so these kind of things we can do to create a particular mold these are called the system sand and when we are using system sand in that case generally we do not use uh, facing sand and backing sand or all, all that because the whole sand we actually manipulated with the help of uh, additives and other different kinds of binding materials and all that so that uh, it can sustain that particular temperature and all that now coarse sand uh, you know that to making the core to create the hollow cavity you know that the core is required to be placed within the mold and that core sand is made of silica sand definitely is there and uh, oil and some other binding materials like uh, dextrin or corn flour these are basically used and again the after that preparing that particular um, mold uh, or, or preparing that core it is again baked baked means it is actually kept in the furnace at a high temperature to increase the compressive strength 
of that particular code and then it is used or placed within the uh, mold okay and uh, the different kinds of uh, clays which are used you know that mainly the clay is the uh, use the uh, most commonly used binder is the clay and there are different kinds of clay which are used as a binder like it can be fire clay it can be bentonite it can be elite or it can be kaolinite bentonite uh, having the highest property as a binder but remember uh, we are always uh, in a it is not that we need all the time the best binder uh, we actually mix all these thing uh, different combinations to get a particular requirement too much bentonite if we give then the uh, binding strength or the uh, strength or the, the mold will become very very hard but at the same time you have to remember that mold should be porous enough so that the moisture can get out so that the gas can get out so it's an optimum value of the hardness of the strength as well as the porosity that is required so it is not that it is always good that if you give a very high strength or, or that means a binder will be very that is not always good it's the optimum value that we are actually looking for next uh, we'll see this is the last side today we are going to discuss the desirable properties of the molding sand and hopefully we'll understand that why these are the desirable properties the first one is the permeability uh, permeability is important because to escape out the moisture and gases uh, it is required and at the same time the hardness and the compressive strength to create the mold so that the mold uh, that is also required so basically uh, one is opposing another you can understand if the permeability is more then hardness definitely will not be more if the hardness of the compressive strength is more then permeability will not be more so basically some optimum value that we have to um, take care uh, finally when we are creating or selecting the sand then uh, molding sand has to be non-reactive with the molten metal it should have a refractoriness we know refractoriness means the high temperature resistance because it has to take the high temperature resistance property collapsible that means uh, you know that at the end finally you have to remove the cast product out of the mold right so at that time uh, you have to uh, break the mold na? so that uh, mold material should be such that it is easily collapsible okay low thermal expansion because if the thermal expansion of the mold material is very high then there is a chance of the distortion allowance that we have already discussed cohesiveness and adhesiveness and definitely uh, these are the properties are important otherwise uh, the sand particles will not attach with one another and for that we use the binders you know uh, like clay and water those are used so that the sand particles can attach it, each other at the same time the adhesiveness is also important so that with the molding flask the uh, mold material is attached otherwise it can lose from the uh, surface then uh, plasticity is again very important uh, so that it can easily shape or mold it so that property is important and definitely water uh, moisture content uh, plays an important role uh, by changing the plasticity flowability is very important flowability of the mold material should be good so that we can easily ram uh, after preparing the mold so that it can easily flow so the ramming power will be less okay so these are the important properties of the molding sand that we are looking for and that is why the sand is found to be or the green sand is found to be the best molding material okay that is why the green sand molding is so popular okay okay in the next class we are going to discuss the other things like uh, uh, different kinds of foundry tool furnaces and the casting defects